At the road, at the coal face, the bottom line, uh, evil manifests on the world mostly through people, and mo I don't know where else it manifests through, and mostly through um, your, your NPD, your, your personality disordered people. Mostly your narcissists, your sociopaths, your psychopaths, these are pers anti-social personality disordered people, and also somewhat through borderlines as well. Borderlines also have a demon in them, I think. Yeah. One thing I've learnt is that these people are associated with addiction. People can get addicted to narcissists. I know this firsthand. And narcissists also are addicted to certain people, particularly to borderlines, but also to codependents because this represents for them a great deal of supply. Narcissists who really don't have any emotions except for anger and, and envy and spite, resentment, you know, all this kind of shit. Negative emotions. They can only feel good when they're doing somebody else pain, when they're causing somebody else pain. Narcissists really are looking for people who can feel a lot of emotion Narcissists see love as a weakness and they see negative energy associated with breaking the heart of one who can love as a source of fuel, as a source of food to be consumed. Get someone who can love, get someone who can love deeply and strongly, put them into a state of love and then dump them viciously, unexpectedly, horribly and then drink up the pain of that person, the delicious pain. Narcissists find your pain to be delicious when they break your heart. How on earth does a narcissist lead you on effectively to get you into this, this place where they can do this to you? Well, first of all, the place where they do this to you is called the shared fantasy. They have to lure you into their fantasy world, which is a dark place, before they can do something bad to you. If you don't go into their fantasy world, they can't do anything really much bad to you. They have to lure you into their fantasy world. And they do it uh, by various different means. But generally speaking, they do it by assessing you, stalking you, assessing you, scanning you, pulling data out from observing you like a predator observes its prey. And what they're looking for is they're looking for your pain. They're looking for your unmet needs that, that need to be met that are not met. And your pain, they're looking for your pain. They're looking for your trauma. They're looking for the bad things that have happened to you that are unresolved. They're looking for all those things. Whether it's a beautiful girl who's going to romance scam me, or whether it's Adolf Hitler who is going to war scam the German public. The narcissist is looking for your trauma. They're looking for your pain. Whether it's a guy like me that hasn't had sex in nine years, hasn't had love in two decades, who has this pain, this unmet need for sex and love from a female. That's, tra that's a kind of trauma, that's your pain, that's your unresolved unmet need, that's your huge motivation. The female romance scammer can pour pot to offer you everything that meets your unmet need. She can be your soulmate. It looks like if you play your cards right, you'll get sex. It looks like if you play your cards right, she's willing to offer you all her love. She feels that strongly about you. She's never loved anybody like she loves me. Or if you're the German public in the 20s and 30s, You've been effed around so much. 
World War I came along and killed millions of you and then you lost the war through a stab in the back at the Versailles Treaty. What was it all for? The exposure to the mustard gas, the artillery shells, the shell shock, the bullets, the maiming, the smashed jaws and teeth and bones, the horribly maimed and disfigured men, no legs, no arms, half their jaw missing, blinded, crazy, nervous system permanently destroyed from shell shock, adrenaline overload, all this, can't sleep for two weeks with artillery shelling, non-stop artillery barges, barrages for two weeks at a time so they can't sleep, they go crazy from the noise. This was World War I. No parachutes in the aircraft. What was it all for? Such a horrible thing, a pain, a trauma that happened to the German people. And by the 20s, they're wondering what the hell was that all for? And, and it's such a, a, a miscarriage of justice. It's such an injustice that was done to us by our politicians. And then in the 20s, they get hyperinflation. Germany, Austria and Hungary get hyperinflation and a few other countries too. All of this, so they've had World War I, they're all smashed to smithereens, they're all smashed up. They lose territory as well. And then, I mean, that's not a footnote, that's like suddenly you've lost all this territory where your houses have been for hundreds of years you have to just leave your farm, it's not yours anymore. It belongs to France, it belongs to Poland. Alsace doesn't belong to Germany anymore, now it belongs to France. Parts of eastern, northeastern Germany no longer belong to Germany, now they belong to Poland. Etc, etc. You've got all your real estate there, your life, you're in the soil, your farmers, factories, residential homes, whole cities. Nope, it's not yours anymore. Get out of there. Get out of there, it's not yours anymore. The trauma just from the displacement of people from redrawn maps to the Germans was immense at the cessation of hostilities of World War I. And then in the 20s, you have the hyperinflation. If you were fortunate enough to have some savings in the bank, they were gone. All your money was stolen from you, stolen, on a mass grand scale by the tens, hundreds, tens of millions of people had their money stolen by hyper inflation in Germany, Austria, Hungary and other countries in the 20s. This didn't happen anywhere else. It didn't happen in the UK, didn't happen in Australia, didn't happen in New Zealand, Canada, didn't happen in the United States. It happened to the Germanic countries and their associates. You had a lot of money in the bank as savings. Suddenly you didn't have jack shit. All your money was worthless. You might as well use your money uh, to light a fire and to keep you warm. You could have a wheelbarrow load of cash. It would just about buy you a, a loaf of bread. That was the hyperinflation. So you had World War I, trauma. You had hyperinflation, trauma. Millions of people getting their money stolen by hyperinflation. People not happy. And then as the 20s were, were going through and the 30s were coming in, you had the communists, the communists coming in, threatening to steal all property, threatening to just confiscate all property by law if they got in and into power, and so on and so forth. You had the, um, the Weimar era of degeneracy, sort of like what we've got going on now with LGBTQ++ pedophile shit, sex change uh, clinics and stuff like that. You had the Frankfurt School with their full-on scientific degeneracy and everything. You had all of that. This is all fucking trauma. And then your soulmate comes along and, and you, do you know what? It's really true. Your soulmate is going to fix all of these problems that have been bestowed upon you by evil forces. It's un, indis, undisputed that evil has beset your country and destroyed all of your lives. And then your soulmate 
you're the nation, you're the collective of people, your soulmate comes along and your soulmate's angry just like you. Your soulmate reflects back to you all of your concerns when no one else would listen. Your soulmate mirrors you. You're angry about all these things. Guess who else is angry about all these things? Adolf Hitler. He's up there on stage. You're angry about the suicide rate. No one else gives a shit. You know what he's doing? He's angry about the suicide rate. You're angry about the communists. So is he. You're angry about the hyperinflation. So is he. You're angry about the Weimar degeneracy. So is he. You're angry about World War One. So is he. You're angry about the hyperinflation. So is he. Wow, I think this guy is your soulmate. He's just the same as you. It's like he's you. Hitler was a reflection of the German people at that time. All of their unresolved traumas. And he was the only one speaking about it. And boy, did he make sense. And then Hitler was voted into power. And then he got into military action with the neighboring countries that had stolen all of Germany's territory in the Versailles Treaty. And do you know what? Just like that, he defeated all of them. He had military victory after stunning military victory. He could do no wrong. Everything worked out just fine. All of his critics were silenced. Is this girl conning me? It feels a bit weird. After a while, I'm saying to myself, you know what? All this kind of stuff that she's doing, I feel so good. I don't care if she's conning me, it feels so good. All my inner critics of her are silenced by how good she makes me feel. The Germans had plenty of critics of Hitler, but he has especially military critics from say the, the Junkers, the, the aristocracy out of Prussia mostly. Some of those guys were critics of Hitler, the Austrian corporal. Those critics were largely silenced by Hitler's mega victories over France particularly and other countries. He just frickin' succeeded everywhere. Well, I guess he's a genius then. I guess he's our, our national soulmate. He cares all about our stuff. He's had amazing success. Guess what Hitler did then? It really looks like that either at a spiritual level or at a human Illuminati Freemason coordinated level, France fell to Germany under Hitler in a matter of days, either by coordination in real life, Freemasons, or by co like agreement between national militaries, or by um, some kind of spiritual influence. I'm not sure which, nobody knows. But I feel there was some design to the whole thing that very much matches the romance scam that I've experienced of late. So the girl comes along to me and love bombs me. I don't believe it, but after a while it feels so fucking good that I don't care if it's fake, I just want more. All my traumas are being addressed by her and no one else gives a shit. No one else cares about me and she's paying such intense attention to me. I'm hooked. I'll follow her anywhere, even off a cliff. I'll follow, I'm in her shared fantasy now I can't really get out. I'll follow her even if it's to my doom. Sound familiar Germans going to the Eastern Front in the 40s? So what I'm poor po what I'm positing here is that Hitler love bombed the German people seemed like the perfect soulmate for the German people. He even defeated France in a matter of days. He's taking care of everything. He's German's national soulmate. He's the God hero we always needed and deserve. 
He love bombed them. He was perfect. You could say he was the, the, the mask of perfection of a narcissist. You could say that. He never lost a battle. And then war was declared with Britain over Poland. But don't worry, Hitler has won all of the battles up to now. He even let the British Expeditionary Force go free at Dunkirk when he could have annihilated them. Nice guy, huh? Magnanimous, if that's the word. Nice. But isn't that a bit funny? He let the British go. And then they get into the Battle of Britain. And they're kind of starting to win the Battle of Britain because they're bombing the airfields, they're not bombing the cities. And as they're starting to, st starting to get the edge over the British, despite British radar, despite British having higher factory production of aircraft than Germany, and despite the British having this gigantic empire, wealthy, perfect, um, full-on education, university, schooling, factory, uh, raw materials acquisition, empire of factories and mines, mines, raw materials supply everywhere across the world, India, Canada, you name it, Africa, Australia. Despite the British having this massive supply line, German submarines and German aircraft are starting to win the Battle of Britain. There's no, there's no sonar right now, it hasn't been invented. As they're about to fucking turn the tide and get the ascendancy and win the Battle of Britain, Hitler goes, you know what? We're gonna stop this strategy that's working for us now well, and it's, it's succeeding for us, of bombing the British airfields where the RAF fighters are taking off from. We're gonna stop bombing those airfields, and for no good reason, we're gonna start bombing civilian homes in London and so on. And that gave respite to the RAF, and they were able to turn the tide quickly because the pressure was off them. Hitler just took the pressure off the RAF what a stupid decision that Hitler made if he wanted to win the Battle of Britain. And Hitler lost the Battle of Britain by losing the ascendancy, giving the advantage to the British, who had radar as well. And then Hitler just gave up. He sort of started a fight with the British and then just sort of gave up and was like, you know what, fuck this. I don't like this party. I want to go and party with the Russians. And time after time after time, Hitler lost and lost and lost by strange decisions. Letting the British go at Dunkirk. Changing strategy that was working to one that wasn't working in the Battle of Britain. Getting to a couple of kilometers away from Moscow and then just going, you know what, fuck this. Yeah, I'm just gonna, I'm just, I'm just gonna whatever, you know, fuck this. Instead of going at Moscow, we're gonna go north and south instead. His generals on the ground were like, what the fuck is Berlin talking about? We're supposed to be going to Moscow. We can get there by tomorrow morning. Why are they sending us north to some small village that doesn't even matter? What the fuck? There were so many lost battles by Hitler once the war started, in fact, there were basically no wins. There were basically no wins. I mean, talk about Stalingrad, right? Oh yeah, let's, let's supply our troops at Stalingrad from the air. Oh, but we don't have the planes and we don't have the fuel and we don't even have the supplies. And the Red Army Air Force is strong now and it's winter and our ground crews are demoralized and they're all just huddling in the corner of the airfield trying not to freeze to death. And there's no support from Berlin they don't even have most of the um, machines to heat up the engines of the aircraft before they start them in those sub-zero temperatures in the Russian winter. Everything goes wrong. Even when Field Marshal Milch goes down there, he's, dry, he, he's in the back of a, a limousine driving across a train track and a fucking train hits the limousine on the train track and Milch gets injured and he's the Field Marshal of the Luftwaffe. Then there was the ME262. Then there was the use of cannons. Cannons weren't used properly enough early enough. They had all the cannons they needed before the war started. They didn't really put them into production until later in the war. 
They had rocket planes and jet planes before the war started. They didn't put them into production until 44. They did some strange shit. They kept on fucking up. They kept on fucking up on purpose the development of the jet plane. First Heinkel had it. It just looked like a 262, but Heinkel had invented it. And then they handed the project to Messerschmitt and then they took the project for the jet fighter off of Messerschmitt and gave it back to Heinkel or someone else. And then they gave it back to Messerschmitt and then they gave it back to Heinkel and they gave it back to Messerschmitt. They kept on saying, you can have it. No, 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 you can have it. No, 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 no we'll, we'll give it back to you. No, 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 we'll give it back. If you actually analyze the Nazi uh, political regime's meddling in the, the, the German Air Force jet fighter program, the only thing you could say is sabotage. They wanted to sabotage the development of that jet so that it would only be available in the last few months of the war. And only in small numbers when there's not even enough chromium to build the, uh, the combustion chamber of the jet. They had to source it from Turkey of all places. And when there's not enough uh, fuel to run these things on a grand scale, not even kerosene for the jets. So and not enough pilots either. All their good pilots were dead. So Germany had all these military victories and then after Poland, they just had fucking loss after loss after loss after loss after loss. They just kept on losing to the, to the allies on the west and on the east fronts. So it's like Hitler could do no wrong and then he got the Germans into the shared fantasy, which is, yeah, we're going to take over all of the world, basically. And by then the Germans were like, hey, we can't really get out of this. We're addicted to this lover of ours. We're addicted to this soulmate of ours. We can't get out of it now. We're, we're trapped in it. And after Poland, it was nothing but loss, 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 loss. Mass rape, mass rape, mass rape, mass death, mass death, mass death in the Rhine Meadows death camps. More Germans died after the war finished than during the war. And most of it was by starvation and maltreatment in camps like Rhine Meadows Death Camp. Try and understand that. Try and wrap your head around that. Millions upon millions of Germans starved to death in the Rhine Meadows Death Camp and others. So this, this was the destruction of heroes. Remember Albert Pike said, if the public needs a hero, we'll give them a hero. I'm not saying that Albert Pike and the Freemasons gave you Hitler, but on some level, if you just, if you just drop all of your preconceived ideas about history and you just look at what happened psychologically between Hitler and the German public, what happened was identical to what happened to me with this romance scammer. They present to you as extremely interested in you. They present to you as perfect, perfect. They present to you as your soulmate. You can't believe your good luck that they showed up out of nowhere. They believe everything that you believe. They love and hold dear everything that you love and hold dear. And they're so good on top of that. They're genius. They're a genius. They're a genius. I've never seen someone so genius as them. They're so smart. They're so good. They're so good looking. They're just perfect. And suddenly you're freezing your eyelids off in sub fucking 35 or 40 degrees C uh, temperatures in frozen Russian winter. Frozen, frozen eyelids that crack off and then the, the victim is left with no eyelids for the rest of their life and they're in some kind of hell. They don't have a, a proper winter clothing and the next morning after a, fro a freezing night at Stalingrad when they've just arrived on the plane from Berlin or from, from North Africa or somewhere, the, the next morning all of their arms are black because they've had severe frostbite and their arms need to be amputated because now they've got necrosis of their skin, their skin's dead, their arms need to be both chopped off. This kind of shit was happening all the time. All the time. That's the German people stuck in the shared fantasy of a demon. 
stuck in the shared fantasy. I mean, it's identical. It's identical to what one experiences of a narcissist it is what the German people experienced with their, with their interfacing with Hitler. Listen, I'm not necessarily, I kind of am, but not really. I'm not saying that he's like a narcissist or an antisocial personality disorder person. But listen, one of the problems that people have when they're stuck in the shared fantasy and things have been going wrong for a while is they've always got this kind of inner monologue mantra where they're kind of saying to themselves, well, look, I know how good it was in the beginning. If we could only get back to the good old days, if we could only get back to when we first met, those were golden days. They loved me so much and I loved them so much and they were perfect and everything was good and they were so attentive to my needs. They cared about every little thing about me and for me and, and they wanted to take such good care of me. They loved me so much. They loved me like no one's ever loved me before. They said to me, I've loved you like no one's ever, like I've no, I've loved you like I've never loved anyone. And then everything just turns to shit after that. And so the victims of this kind of narcissistic abuse that are now stuck in the shared fantasy and now the, the narcissist has got them there, they're not leaving because they're addicted, they're stuck there. And now the narcissist can start to extract supply from them, torment them, destroy them, humiliate them, uh, pull the negative energy out of them and feast on it. Feast on the negative energy. Are you telling me that those who are freezing to death and getting horribly maimed on the Eastern Front in winter. Are you telling me that, that they weren't producing negative energy? They were producing a lot of negative energy and demons were feasting on that. And the principal individual that is identified as getting the German nation into horrible situations like the Eastern Front is Adolf Hitler. I'm just telling you, I've noticed a 100% match, a 110% fit of the cycle of abuse of a narcissist with their victim and Adolf Hitler and the nation of the Germans. In 2010 or 2011, I woke up, I, 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 I had this red pill moment, I woke up and I was like, holy shit, all the Jews today in the media causing all these problems, Bernie Madoff, George Soros, blah, blah, etc., etc. Genuinely, there's a lot of Jews that are elite, elite Jews who are causing so many problems. And Hitler was opposing the Jews and the Jews were opposing Hitler because he was calling out the Jews. Oh my God, Hitler was right. Oh my God, Hitler was right. That was my epiphany. That was my waking up in around 2011. That was one layer of the truth. There's a deeper layer. I'm telling you, there's a deeper layer. And the deeper layer is what I've just described. It's, it's this link with narcissism, the cyclic behavior, the machine-like predictable behavior of a demon, of a narcissist is identical to Hitler's interfacing with the, the German people, the German, the, the German nation. Find out what their trauma is. Offer them solutions to all of their trauma. Be this perfect, 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 perfect person who never even loses a fight ever. Oh my God, he's so perfect. Everybody gets lured in, even his critics are silenced. The last vestiges of your conscience screaming at you, the volume is turning down. When, when this beautiful girl like nobody ever else has shown you such attention. You don't realize that she's a con artist or the part of you that does realize she's a con artist and is conning you. You don't want to listen to that part of yourself. It's screaming at you, but you turn the volume down on it. You see like, I don't want to listen to this. I'm feeling great. I don't want to listen to this. The German nation was the same thing. This girl is romance scamming me to get sadistic supply from me. She's offering me this beautiful fantasy I'm going to get sex, I'm going to get love, I'm going to get romance, 
I'm gonna get soul connection. I'm gonna have a dream world, a dream life. She knows just what I want and she's prepared to offer it to me. And that's what she wants as well. This is a spider, a female spider, weaving a web, mimicking her prey. Ready to fucking suck the life out of her prey. She's got to get you into the web first. She's got to get you into the shared fantasy. Once she's got you into the web, you're trapped. You can get out maybe before she gets her fangs into you. But once you're stuck in that spider web, most of the time you're not getting out of it. And don't you agree that the German people got stuck in a shared fantasy with Hitler that was not unlike a spider's web? Once they realized that they needed to get out, they couldn't. Do you know that of all the two wars, the war that really had a lot of mutiny was World War II. And the mutiny, the most mutiny in, well, in all the world wars, World War I and World War II, was, in, was the Germans and the Russians on, on respective sides mutinying, mutinying on the Eastern Front. The, the conditions on the Eastern Front were so horrid. I can't remember the exact statistics, but it was something like 30,000 Germans mutinied on the Eastern Front and were executed. There was a record number of soldiers on the Eastern Front executed. That means hung or shot dead by their own army, by their own side, by their own generals, by their own people. A record number of soldiers executed for mutiny on, on both the Russian and the German side on the Eastern Front. Conditions were so bad. It was something like 25 or 30,000 Germans mutinied and were executed on the Eastern Front and something like uh, 40 or 50,000, maybe 60,000 Russians more, it's more than Germany, mutinied on the Eastern Front and were executed, either hung or shot dead. A lot of men in those armies on the Eastern Front, both Russians and Germans, saw the writing on the, on the wall, realized that it was madness and fucking mutinied and so many of them were executed. You don't really read about that in the history books, do you? All you hear about is, oh, the Russians are so keen to fight the Germans. Oh, the Germans are so keen to fight the Russians. 20, 30,000 Germans weren't keen. They were like, fuck this, this is bullshit. They just walked away and they were captured and, sh and shot dead or hung. Same with the Russians, 40, 50, 60,000 Russians on the Eastern Front. They were like, this is bullshit, I'm not doing this. They walked away, they were recaptured and they were shot or hung in executions by the Red Army. There is a, a, a curious similarity that both opposing armies have with each other that on the Eastern Front, they both had high mutiny numbers, high mutiny numbers. This represents the empath waking up once the uh, anesthetic wears off a bit, finding themselves adhered to a fucking spider's web and realizing, oh my God, I'm stuck here. I'm stuck here, I'm stuck here. I'm stuck here. Yeah, you're stuck in a thing called a shared fantasy of a demon. You can't get out now, you're stuck in the web. I'm telling you, you, you probably can't conceptualize what a shared fantasy is. It takes a while or it takes some experience maybe of yourself empirically to know what a shared fantasy is. A narcissist can't very well harm you unless they entice you into their shared fantasy. Like I said, in the case of Hitler and the Germans, it was something like Hitler's perfect. He wins all these battles. He wants to solve, he's cured the economy. The economy is now perfect. Hitler solved the economy. He even built the Olympics, had the Zeppelin flying over, restored national pride. We can be proud again. Our, our honor has been restored. Hitler is perfect. And then after the Battle of Dunkirk, suddenly Hitler can't win at all and he never wins and he just, he just keeps fucking up one, one time after another. This is so reminiscent of the mask of perfection, the love bombing and enticing you into the shared fantasy with it from a narcissist. 
You think they're a perfect person. You think they're your soulmate. You love them so much. You've never experienced anything like this. This is perfect. There is a little, there's always a little voice in the back of your, your mind, in the back of your head that says, you're being ripped off. You're being conned. They're too good to be true. But it feels so good that that little voice, you turn the volume off. You don't turn it up. You don't listen to it anymore. You turn the volume off. You ignore. You turn a blind eye to that voice in your head that says, don't trust this person. They're a fucking vampire. They just want to get you miserable and suck all of your life force energy out of you. They want to bleed you dry in the snow of the steppes of Russia. They want to bleed you dry. The Germans were tricked by truth. The Germans loved truth and loved justice. Hitler gave them truth and justice. That was how he tricked them. They had a deficit of truth and justice. Hitler gave them truth and justice, and then he got them into the shared fantasy with that method. Once they're in the shared fantasy, they're in the spider's web. There's no getting out of it. They're gonna die, they're gonna be raped. They're gonna lose all their property and all their territory even more than before. It's no joke. They're in an existential crisis. They're in a death ride towards 1945 April. They're totally fucked because they're stuck in this shared fantasy and there's no exit, there's no escape until the logical conclusion. How do you exit the shared fantasy? Well, you could kind of see some Germans, I don't think this is really a, a proper attempt to exit the shared fantasy, but with the, um, the bomb plot, uh, Stuffenberg and all that, you could argue that that's an attempt, a feeble, too little, too late attempt to exit the shared fantasy. But really the Germans were sucked in hook, line and sinker into the shared fantasy and once they were in it, they just couldn't get out of it until they were destroyed. Jezebel, the demon spirit, her remit is to, her, is that the right word, remit? Her mission is to kill, steal and destroy. If you look at what happened to the Germans as a result of World War II, it was killing, stealing and destroying. All their cities were destroyed. All their men and women and children were killed. And their property and their territory, their very territory was stolen. If you look at a pre-World War II map of Germany, at its peak, from bloody uh, Alsace-Lorraine on the border of France, right across to Danzig and Czechoslovakia and uh, Konigsberg, the capital of Germany proper, Konigsberg, also the capital city of the state of Prussia, where Frederick the Great was from. This whole big stretch of territory extended out across the Baltic towards Latvia, Lithuania and Estonia and Poland. All of that now belongs to Poland and Russia. It's all been taken from Germany. That's the stealing right there. Jezebel stole from German nation. Jezebel killed German nation. Jezebel destroyed all of the German cities. Why? Why? Why, what kind of a day was yesterday? Why, what kind of a romance day was yesterday? Why, wasn't yesterday Valentine's Day? Now then, why wasn't Valentine's Day yesterday? Why wasn't yesterday the bombing of Dresden, 79th anniversary? Wasn't yesterday the anniversary of the bombing of Dresden? And wasn't yesterday Valentine's Day, the day of love? The day of love? Wasn't this the worst bombing of a city in the history of the world, the bombing of Dresden? Weren't something like 600,000 people cooked alive so that their fat was running in the gutters in the high streets of that big city? It wasn't even a military target, it was a wooden city as well. Why wasn't yesterday Valentine's Day, February the 14th? And why wasn't yesterday also a significant anniversary of World War II? The bombing of Dresden? 
you can see some kind of spiritual mockery of the victim here. Oh, you want some love? Yeah, I love you so much. My name's, my name's your soulmate. I love you so much. Now your city is going to be firebombed on the day of love and it's going to result in probably the worst, uh, the worst bombing episode of a city in world history. Firestorms, knee-deep human fat uh, accumulated in basements where people were sheltering like air raid shelters. They were cooked to death. Cooked like, like a chicken in an oven. All the fat running down. Piled high bodies. Dresden, the day of love. Valentine's Day. This is on a spiritual plane. This is on a spiritual level. This is a mockery of the target. The narcissist always mocks the target. It's, it's a legalistic, lawyeristic terms and conditions that they, they abide by most sincerely. As I was getting sucked into the shared fantasy, she said to me, well, if you like masochism, keep coming back if you like masochism. What she's saying there is that she's a sadist and all that she's going to offer me is pain. If you like pain, keep coming back because all I've got for you is pain. Mocking the victim. Elaborate rituals. Like what? Elaborate. Elaborate rituals like seeming to offer you a chance at sex and love and romance. Seeming to offer you that. Elaborately going into detail of seeming, seeming to offer you. It's an elaborate ritual and it's mocking the victim because it's not real. It's fake. It has all of the hallmarks of love and the potential the potential, the potential for fully realized love and sex, but it's mockery of the victim. It's like saying, look, I've got this nice big cake and you can eat it if you play the cards right, but the cake might actually be a movie set prop that's made out of rubber and they're never even going to let you get near that cake. They're just kind of offering it to you, but you can't quite reach it and it was made of rubber anyway. That's what this prospect that they're dangling in front of you, it's a huge carrot. Look, love, real love, real love. Valentine's Day, look, real love. Bombing the city with fire incendiaries, fat rolling down, fat, fat cascading along the gutters in the, in the middle of a giant city, human fat, firebomb, Tornadoes whirling across the streets. Huge, big, 100 meter tall fire tornadoes. Tornadoes, twisters made of fire. Fire bombing, fire storming. Dresden was a fire storm. This is your love. This is your romance. This is your sex. This is your perfect soulmate partner. You're in the shared fantasy and now it's too late. You're in a death ride. All of that remit of Jezebel to kill, steal and destroy is personified in the fire bombing of Dresden by incendiaries by the RAF on February the 14th. Valentine's Day. That's your love. <laughs> this is your love. I cause you pain. That's how I love you, says the demon. This girl that romance scams me, the more pain I cause you, that's how I love you. I love you by causing you pain. The two things are connected. My sadism, your masochism, that's my love, it's your pain. My love of you is your pain. I love you so much when I cause you so much pain. I've never loved you like I've loved anyone. You've allowed me to cause you so much pain and it has caused me to love you so much. That's literally the deal. These demons get off on causing you pain. They're, they're in an orgasm from causing you pain. Causing you pain to them is orgasmic. You get it? 
there's a 110% match between Hitler and his relationship with the German nation and people and what I've experienced with a romance scamming sadistic cerebral schizoid narcissist female who romance scammed me completely for sadistic supply. 110% match. There's not even an overlap. All of the cycle checks out and it's one cycle that's machine-like and that is photocopied a million billion times over in the experience of other human beings with narcissists, with, with antisocial personality disordered individuals. I'm telling you, it's a 100% match. Oh, but Hitler said this and Neville Chamberlain said that, blah, blah, blah. I'm not talking on that plane. I'm talking on a psychological slash spiritual plane. The relationship. Once you're in that shared fantasy. So how did I manage to extract myself from the shared fantasy? I believe if I did it, it was probably only in the last few days or few weeks. How did I do it? I did my best to mortify the narcissist, to embarrass and humiliate them. And I also did my best to try and see them in a more realistic light. It occurred to me that I was seeing them in a light of perfection. I was seeing them as a perfect person, which flew in the, in the face and contradicted my own observations that they were hardly a perfect person. All the evil that they'd subjected to me, me too, all the evil that they'd su subjected me, me to showed me that they're not a perfect person. So why was I always thinking of them as a perfect person? There's a, a word which I can't remember now. It's like uh, idago or imago or something. It basically means an insect that has reached its final form. It's got wings and it's sexually mature an insect that goes from being a grub or a worm or a chrysalis to breaking out and becoming a flying insect like a dragonfly or a butterfly. I think it's idago or something. There's a word for it. It's also used in psychology to mean an internalized uh, image that you have of somebody external to you. And it, it's an image of perfection that's in your mind. And I'm reading a book at the moment about uh, psychopaths and it's written by somebody who's a hypnotist. And he's saying, once you get that, he doesn't swear very often in the book, but he says, he's British. He says, once you get that perfect image of the psychopath in your mind, once you let them put that image, first of all, the psychopath is trying to put an image of perfection of themselves into your mind. They're trying to put an image in your mind of them, the psychopath, as being a perfect person. And this guy was a hypnotist and he was saying that psychopaths are always hypnotizing people. Every time a psychopath speaks to you, they're engaging in the tactics that, that cause you to be hypnotized. And what they're, what they're doing all the time is they're trying to put an image of themselves into your head that that, that image looks perfect. Doesn't that sound like Hitler? In the late 1930s, he's this perfect guy. All the German nation had in their heads this image of Hitler as this perfect guy. He's Hitler. He's a rock star. He's our savior. He's fixed the economy. The degeneracy's gone. He's defeated France. He's made the British respect us again. He's fucking perfect. He even got our territories back from Poland. He even made the French piss in the railway carriage at the Versailles Treaty. He's our savior, he's our Lord, he's our God. He's a perfect person. That's the idago. That's the, the insect in its final form. That's the image of perfection. That's the image of perfection that, that the German nation had in their minds collectively of a perfect, perfect, perfect soulmate. Soulmate, perfect soulmate perfect person and then look how bad it went after that after that it was all negativity it was all sorrow it was all prime conditions for a demon to feast and to suck out the life force energy 
the object libido, the psyche drive of the German nation collectively to suck out all of their life force energy, to bleed them dry, to feast on their tears and their sorrow. But at first there was this perfect person. So, so the Germans didn't manage to break out of the shared fantasy that they got in with Hitler. They just didn't manage to do it. And now they will never trust again. Now they will never love a leader again. Look at some of the leaders that they've had lately, like Merkel. Merkel is an anti-charismatic leader. She's not charismatic at all. She smells like talk, chalk dust. Just looking at Merkel, I get the feeling that if I patted her on the chest, chalk dust would, would puff up. Like she just looks so old and dusty and disgusting. She looks, talking about spiderwebs, she looks like she'd have spiderwebs in between her legs. She looks like her breath would stink. Merkel is, is the opposite of Hitler. She's like this totally non-charismatic, non-nationalistic, non-interested non in, in idealism or anything like that. Idealismus or whatever, idealismus. No idealism anymore. The Germans don't want idealism. They don't want to dream again because all of their dreams have been smashed by their loved one, their beloved one, the one that loved them like he'd never loved anyone else before. Their special one, their mon shu shu. You're my mon shu shu. You're my special one. You make my world go round. This was the relationship of the German nation with Hitler. And this was my relationship with a, a lying, romance scamming, female sadistic cerebral schizoid narcissist. You're my mon shu shu. You make the world go round for me. I've never loved anybody like I love you. This is the kind of relationship. It's all fake! It's all fucking fake! Everything I do, I do it for you. Everything I've ever done, I've done it for you. Everything I've ever done, I've done it for you. Don't you know, dear one, everything I've ever done, I did it for you. This is the kind of language of a love bombing mask of perfection narcissist. Isn't it true that everything that Hitler ever did, he did it for the German people? And look at the result. Mass generation of traumatic psyche energy that demon could suck that energy out and feast on it like never before. Not to mention of just of the Germans, but also of everybody else, the Russians as well, a lot of Russians getting killed. But I'm only focusing on Hitler and the Germans and comparing and contrasting it to my experience of a, a narcissistic romance scammer. I mean, there's a lot of people today that they see the, the love that Hitler was showing for the German people and nation, and they're like, that's true love. I love Hitler because that's true love. Look how he loved the Germans. And look at his actions. He fixed everything. He fixed everything. Yeah, he fixed everything until Dunkirk, and then he, then he just fucked everything up. Oh, but it, it wasn't his fault. Oh, he loved them so much. No, listen, when you talk to people that are victims of romance scamming narcissists, they say, oh, but he means well. They always make excuses for the bad behavior of the narcissist because they remember how good it was in the beginning. Male or female, if they're conned into a relationship in a shared fantasy with a narcissist, and if they're getting their heart broken on the daily, If everything's going bad, if their partner's cheating on them multiple times, if their partner's ignoring them, giving them the silent treatment, getting off on their pain, their psyche energy, their romantic pain, their heart broken, they're in love so much with a fake person and now the real person has come out now that they're trapped in the shared fantasy. 
You talk to them because you can see a bit more clearly and you say, what do you see in this person? They're destroying your life. Oh, but he means well. Oh, but she means well. Oh, one day we're going to get back to how it was in the beginning. He's just under stress. She's just under a lot of pressure at the moment. She'll get back to her old self when XYZ is finished, when this, this work t uh, contract is over, when this job project is over, then she will be under, then we'll be on holiday and things will be like they were in the beginning. We'll both be relaxing by the pool on deck chairs in Greece. It'll be back to the way it was in the beginning. Everything will be perfect again. You'll see. But it never goes back to perfect because now you're trapped in the shared fantasy and now they're extracting the sadistic supply from you and, and bit by bit they're dropping that fucking mask and you can see the evil salivating lizard grinning at you as it takes the mask off and you can't do anything. By addiction, you're adhered there like an insect stuck in a spider's web and you can't do anything at all to get out of it. You don't even want to get out of it. You love it so much, but it's causing you so, mu so much pain. As the spider sinks its fangs into your neck and sucks out your blood and injects poison to liquefy your insides and to completely obliterate you, you love it so much. You feel so much. It's not, it's not so much love. You feel so much infatuation for your abuser when they're doing this to you. And you just keep thinking about how good it was. And they keep giving you periodically little tiny tastes of how good it was. There's a name for it. It's called intermittent reinforcement. There's a name for it. It's called bread crumbing. Oh, we've got this wonder weapon of wonder, uh, wonder waffen or whatever. We've got this wonder weapon. Oh, we've got these new tanks. They're called tigers. They're called king tigers. King, uh, Koenig, Koenig tiger panzer. We've got the biggest and the best tanks in the world. It's a wonder weapon. There's talk of a huge bomb that can just blow away cities. It's a wonder weapon that Hitler's got, he's working on it. He's gonna release it soon. It never came, it was a future fake. Hitler held people spellbound, that's agreed. And he even held them spellbound by different techniques. Towards the end of the war, it was, well, don't worry, I've got a wonder weapon or two up my sleeve. I've got a wonder weapon or three up my sleeve. I've got these jets and these rockets. I've got these television guided cable uh, actuated uh, rocket uh, flying guided bombs I've, I've got all this stuff I've got night vision scopes for our weapons and I've got automatic weapons assault rifles the forerunner to the AK-47 and the M16 I've got it all I've got all these these high tech you're Germans right you love high technology you know that high technology is what you love and what you produce from your creativity. And you know that high technology solves all your problems, right, Germans? And Hitler's got all this high technology for you. He's got the jet planes. He's got the, the uh, bloody uh, MP44, uh, STG44 assault rifle with a 30 round magazine of 7.92. This is a revolutionary weapon. This is gonna help us to win the war. We got these King Tigers, the King, the Koenig Tiger. It's untouchable on the battlefield, but we don't have any fuel to put in it. It's a great tank though. So Hitler was future faking the Germans towards the end with the King, the King Tiger, the Messerschmitt ME262 jet fighter. All these wonder weapons and rumors of wonder weapons like atomic bomb type wonder weapons. They even had some wonder weapons already. They had not only sarin, but they had tarbun. Sarin and tarbun gas. They had thousands, tens of thousands of tons of stockpiled sarin and tarbun gas. I mean, that shit, if they had deployed it, they probably could have won. They probably could have destroyed Moscow and destroyed London by de deploying those weapons and de destroyed Washington if they, or, or New York, or all of those. That's like, that's like a nuclear level weapon and they didn't deploy it. They built it, they stockpiled it, they didn't use it. They did have a wonder weapon there, they didn't use it. Funny, huh? 
Even as Hitler was allegedly on the verge of committing suicide in the bunker, I suppose he did, he never went, you know what, I've got this big stockpile of sarin and tabun, why don't I just dump it all on Moscow? Why don't I just dump it all on London? Why don't I just dump it all uh, on uh, New York or Washington? Why don't I launch coordinated Pearl Harbor, Kota Baru style attacks all at once, all at the same time across the world in different time zones on all of the, these key strategic brain centers of the allies and just wipe them out? Why don't I just do that? He never did that. Could have won the war probably or, or held the allies to a grinding halt. Oh shit, all of our leaders are dead. All of our bureaucracy has gone. Hitler didn't do it. He had the capacity to do it. He didn't do it. Funny that, huh? Almost like it was a fantasy, like it was a future fake, like it was a shared fantasy. Okay, so I'm going to run out of battery soon. That's an hour and nine minutes, basically. I just wanted to try and really drive it home to you, regardless of what your politics are, whatever. The relationship of Hitler to the German nation and people is identical to the experience that I've had with a romance scamming narcissist. The difference between Hitler and the German nation and people and myself in this romance scamming narcissist is that I have, I believe, managed to successfully extract myself from the shared fantasy. And that's what the Germans didn't do. That's what the Germans didn't do. And how do you do it? Well, you wake up and you stop having this idago or whatever it's called in your mind, this hypnotist's perfect object of, of the psychopath in your mind that says to you, this person is perfect. The idea of the Führer, the leader, is that he's perfect and therefore everything that he says for us to do, we must do it without question. And that underpins the Führer being perfect, underpins the psychopath being perfect, this image of your brain in your mind of a psychopath being perfect, is that they're a perfect person and it's been proven to you. They've loved you so much. They've been there for you. They're, they're, they're your soulmate. Everything that you like, they like. Everything that you're concerned and worried about, they're concerned and worried about. It's amazing that you've met this person. You're so lucky to have met this person, says the German people to themselves about Adolf Hitler. So the image, you know, the image that they have collectively in their minds of Hitler is this kind of, whatever it's called, Idago, Im 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 Imago. I-M-A-G-O, Imago or Imago. The Imago is the insect's final form, sexually mature and with wings, like a dragonfly that used to be a grub. Dragonfly lives underwater for six years and then it breaks out of its chrysalis and it stops being a grub or a worm under the water in a chrysalis for six years and it turns into a flying insect that's out in the air, breathing air and flying around. It doesn't bear any resemblance at all to its pre imago form it's in its final form it's in its perfection form well the psychopath's imago that they're constantly trying to put into your head is that of the dragonfly not the worm under the water they want to put in your head of them an image of perfection and i admit it i had in my head for so long this image of perfection of this girl it's not even a girl it's a woman okay and it was very hard, even though you could see the flaws, they were blatant and obvious, it was very hard to break out of this, this imago that they're a perfect person. It's addiction. It's illusion. It's hypnotism. So same, same for the Germans with Hitler. Oh, but he's perfect. He, 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 he did all this good stuff. He did all this good stuff. He kept on winning all these battles. He's perfect. Yeah, but we're currently freezing to death in Stalingrad. And you, you, you think he's perfect. Well, well, yeah, things are going to be good again. He, all of his original victories are going to happen again. we just got to stick it out. we just got to put up with enough bullshit and, and then things will turn good again. It doesn't matter that we haven't seen the Luftwaffe in the skies for a couple of months. Things will turn good, I'm sure. Meanwhile, the Luftwaffe has got no fuel. All their pilots, all their good pilots are dead. 
and Goring's refusing to even talk about the 262 at the emergency jet fighter conference. I mean, things were grim. The reality was grim. But people had this imago of Hitler in their minds collectively as a nation. They just remembered the glory, the good days, the good. They all said it. They all said it. They said that the days under Hitler in the civilian times were the best moments of their life. The days under Hitler were the best times of their life, even better than the post-war period when they had peace. Even better than that. Much, much, much better than that. The times under Hitler in peace, and even in the early stages of the of the pre-war and the phony war, and of uh, and of the the early war in '39, those were the best times. It was only really as things started to get shitty at the end of '42, perhaps, or maybe earlier, if your loved one died earlier. But I mean, collectively, as the as the national identity of Germany, things were so good for so long under Hitler. People had just come to accept that Hitler was a demigod or a god that could do no wrong. They just had this firmly entrenched idea in their minds, this imago, this image of perfection of Hitler, that he could do no wrong. He'd proven to them over and over again how perfect he was for them, how suitable he was for them, how well he matched them, how, how well he cared for their every need. He'd proven it. This is why the Germans loved Hitler so much. He proved to them how good he was. And by doing this, they just came to know this image of perfection of Hitler. Hitler's shit, when he goes to the toilet, doesn't even stink. He's that good. Image of perfection. It's a psychological phenomenon and it's fractal. It can be one person with another person or it can be collectively the entire nation of Germany, for example, 80 million people, 80 million people, eight zero million people with an imago in their head of their leader as a person of perfection that's so perfect that voluntarily they give up their own free will to do whatever he says whenever he says it. That person is so perfect because they they proved it to you. Your, your trauma was so bad and he, your need, your unmet need was so great. Remember what I said about Versailles, about the, the hyperinflation, about World War I, about the communists, about the humiliation, the hyperinflation, the, the, the Weimar degeneracy, the, the, the Frankfurt School, the sex change, the, the transvestites, the, the pedophilia, everything, everything. The, the rampant, disgusting, hideous prostitution. Germany, the prostitution capital of the world in Weimar, totally humiliated, totally broke, all the money gone, stolen, inflated away to nothing. Can't even hardly get enough food imported into the country to feed the people in the country. Humiliated, starving, committing suicide by the tens of thousands every year. No hope at all. This is an unmet need. And then a hero comes along. And when a hero comes along, and you na 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 na. It's like a Whitney Houston song out of Bodyguard. And I will always love you. Ooh. That's the German people singing their love ballad to Hitler because he sang that love ballad right to them in the beginning and they're just singing it back to him. He's just mirroring them. He's just reflecting them. This narcissist woman, she mimicked me for years on end to try and entice me into the shared fantasy and eventually it worked. And Hitler mimicked the German people's heartfelt desires, unmet needs, loves, cares, passions. He mimicked them perfectly for years on end and they came to love him for it as though he was them themselves. It's the formula for popularity. Mimic the idealized self of the target. Mimic the idealized collective self of a nation 
even smart people like Germans, mimic their collective idealized self, purport to meet their unmet needs, they're gonna be addicted to you, they're gonna walk, they're gonna be sucked in hook, hook, line and sinker, they're gonna be walked collectively into and voluntarily. Hitler talked about sleepwalking. I go forth with the assurance, the assurity of a sleepwalker, with the confidence of a sleepwalker. You could just as well say that the German people went forth with the assurity and the confidence of a sleepwalker. Where did they go forth to? Where did they progress to? They walked forth like a hypnotized sleepwalker right into Hitler's shared fantasy. And it felt so good. They were in love. They'd met their soulmate. There isn't anything on earth that they wouldn't do for him. They'd even give him complete power and control of decision making for them to him. Don't worry Hitler, you're so good at making decisions, we'll just let you make the decisions for us. You're so good. None of us can make decisions as good as you can. That's what the narcissists want, they want complete control over you. They want to make all the decisions for you. And then they're going to start causing you pain. They're going to, once you're in that shared fantasy, they'll take the mask off and they'll start biting into your neck with their fangs, their spider fangs, and injecting poison into your neck and sucking the blood out of you and sucking the life force energy out of you. Sucking the object libido out of you. Sucking the psyche drive out of you. Whatever psyche energy you have, the psyche drive that powers you along and gives you energy, all that energy that they suck it out of you. They suck it out of you. And once it's gone, you're an empty husk. Just like if you ever see an exoskeleton of an insect, once a spider has had its way with the insect, there's nothing left but the exoskeleton and it's hollow. There's no substance inside that exoskeleton anymore. It's all been liquefied and sucked out and consumed by the spider. And how did the spider do it? It's one of the only species that mimics its prey is the spider. And the narcissist mimics its, its prey, the, its target. The, the parallels are profound. They don't just overlap, they're 100% match. That's basically the end of the video. I just wanted to um, point out that on a fractal scale, the relationship of the German people to Hitler was identical to the relationship of a love-bombed target of a narcissist uh, and a narcissist. And I also wanted to point out that I believe, it's perhaps too early to tell, but I, I don't think so. I believe that I've resoundingly turned over a new leaf and changed course, changed, changed direction. And I think that I've mostly, if not at all, mostly if not completely now, extracted myself from the shared fantasy that I was lured into. And let me tell you, it's addiction, it's hard to get out so fucking hard to get out of a shared fantasy. Just ask the German people on Valentine's Day in World War II when Dresden was obliterated and 600,000 people were, were cooked to death in a firestorm oven, cooked to death. Their fat liquefied and running down the gutters in the main streets of the big city Dresden. Just ask them about getting out of a shared fantasy. Just ask them about extricating themselves out of a shared fantasy. They'd never managed to do it and they paid the price. And now they're cynical and they're hardly alive. They're a dead nation and they'll probably never live. They'll probably never love again. They'll never trust another Valentine's Day because it was, it was Dresden. They'll never trust another lover. If someone offers them love and appears perfect, no, you're going to hurt me like last time. No, I don't trust you at all. I'm so smart, I will never love again. I don't trust you at all. That's a, it's a German mentality now. Don't love, don't trust. Look what happened last time. You don't get it, do you? You were lured into the shared fantasy of a demon. It's identical. It's on a psychological, spiritual level, this, this trickery, this bait and switch. 
Look at the results. At first, everything was perfect. And then, for a much longer period of time, everything was very, very not perfect. And then it was too late to back out. Once they, once they started mutinying on the Eastern Front by the tens of thousands, it was too late. They were, they were stuck on the death ride. So what about me? Did I get out in time and how did I do it? That's the really important thing. Now that I've established the, the concepts and the parallels and so on, the overlaps and the, the matches, listen, it's a fingerprint match. What happened to the German nation and people at the hands of, of because of their interaction with their, their lover, their soulmate Hitler, is a fingerprint identikit match to what happens to an individual who has been romance scammed by a malignant narcissist that is looking to extract sadistic supply from a target. Suck the life force energy out of them. Well, um, I mean, I, I'm, I'm in the midst of it. I haven't, you know, gotten fully... There's light at the end of the tunnel. I've mostly broken the addiction and I'm mostly extricating myself now from the shared fantasy. Perhaps I've already done it. Certainly, if I can go on for the rest of 2024 without really um, focusing on any of on, on this broad, and I can focus on other things that are more important, like making money, making some real friends that are not evil, that kind of thing. Maybe even getting a girlfriend. Maybe even sex and romance with a girl who is actually meeting my needs, such as unvaccinated, young, of the same race as me hopefully good looking um, with it with a non-traumatic uh, childhood early life background if i can find someone like that i mean that that beats the socks off of a pseudo relationship with a, a, a romance scamming narcissist doesn't it so you know if i can switch focus um, sufficiently deeply enough genuinely legitimately if i can switch focus that's all there is to it so how do you switch focus? Well, you, you've, got to, you've got to wake up from the imago and realize that the imago doesn't in any way, shape or form match the reality. And this is, I hope I've got enough battery and, and storage space to make this point. I had a, talking about romance, talking about sex, talking about Valentine's Day. When I was about 22, I had a 19 year old girlfriend. To, to cut a long story short, she was a narcissist. She had childhood trauma of a really bad kind. She'd been raped by her own dad, that's incest. And she was fucked up. She was, I didn't know what a narcissist was back then, but she was a narcissist. And my relationship with her was confusing and it was painful. And um, at first I really loved her and I really was attracted to her. I even loved her smell. I loved how she smelled. These days, if I smell, it's, it's rare, it's so rare, not so much now, but if I ever smell a woman walking by or something in, in, in Bunnings or something or in the shops, in the supermarket, the hardware store. If I smell a woman that smells like she does, like it instantly brings back this like love memory of her. I loved her. She did it for me. She was good enough for me. I wanted her in my life. I wanted her. But she caused me so much pain. But when I managed to extract myself successfully from the shared fantasy that she'd lured me into. It, I'll tell you one of the things that I first uh, comprehended or came across or came to know. She, like she was such a disgusting bitch and she was so weird, she was so odd that I, I really wasn't seeing it for the longest time. I was just having love, love goggles. I was just thinking she was a perfect person for me, you know, it, Here's, here's the first girl, I had a girlfriend before that that was obese and I didn't, I, I just wanted to try out having a girlfriend but when I was 16, but now I was like 21, like here's a, a proper girl, she's good looking, she's got nice curves and nice chest and nice hips and everything, she's got nice blondish hair, nice bluish eyes, a nice pleasant face, nice lips, I like this girl. But then I saw her in a different light. I met her family. I met her brother, her, her immediate young brother with a cleft palate. And he seemed like he was uh, a bit unstable. And one time she said to me that he was, he was a street, he'd become a street kid and he, he'd become homeless. 
and uh, she had an even younger brother that was much younger, maybe a decade younger than the than immediate younger brother. And the, the, the youngest brother, he, he had sort of, he didn't look sort of um, Anglo-Saxon like she and her older brother, she and the, the, the older brother looked compared to the younger brother. The younger brother looked sort of more brown and her mother sort of looked brown. Her mother was a bit Aboriginal and um, her dad was like Cornish, I think she said, like he was, you know, like blonde, red hair, blue eyes, that kind of thing. And um, there was something strange about her family. There were some weirdos hanging around with her mother and the mother seemed really old and haggard. And um, I think the weirdos hanging around her mother had something to do with drugs. And she said to me that her mother had had so many boyfriends. So many boyfriends were coming over to her mother's place when she was a girl. I mean, just a really bad scene, a really bad environment. And she said of, of her youngest brother, the one that was a bit brown, that sort of took after the mother, that looked a bit Aboriginal, the youngest, like brownish skin, the younger brother, she said that, as she put it, she was afraid that he was not getting enough food. She was afraid that he was, as she put it, malnutritioned. I think she meant to say malnourished. She said her youngest brother, she was afraid that he was malnutritioned. She meant to say mal malnourished. And indeed, he looked fucking skinny. I wonder if that kid was getting enough food. Stuff like that. And I was still passionately French kissing her at the traffic lights, driving her back from her, her mum's place, at the suburb and the house where her mum lived with all these weirdos hanging around and all these, these kids in d sort of dire condition. I have passionately French kissed her at the lights as we're waiting for the red light to go green. And I mean, I was just in love goggles, but I wasn't really taking note of what I was seeing. All these warning signs, all these, all these gross and disgusting things, all of this instability, all this strangeness and oddness and things that don't add up and people that give you the creeps, you just ignore it all. And so I was, I was in the shared fantasy with her. And in the end, um, I got pissed off with her. I, uh, I found out how she was totally um, like not loyal to me. Her housemates that she was staying with spilled the beans and told me and actually printed out her emails from, from other guys and brought them to me. And we sat down in the food court at Marion Shopping Center, me and Leah and Dan, who were still together and have a great family. And they basically spilled the beans to me and they said, look, she's not who she seems to be. Look at all this shit that she's up to. And I was so angry. And so basically me and her split up. And um, she started text messaging me again for months and months and months, kind of stalking me, just constantly bombarding me with text messages. And I was just treating her like shit at that point. I was just like, fuck off, ho in my text messages because I was so angry and she didn't seem to mind at all. She didn't mind the, this at all. And eventually it was, she wanted to meet. She wanted to sleep over at my place. And, and I had a new job. I was selling cars, I was selling Mercedes Benz and I didn't tell her, but she sniffed it out. She managed to sniff that I had some new job. She managed to sniff that I was living in the city. She saw that she, she could, I kind of like psychically, telepathically sniff that I had become a bit successful. I turned over a new leaf. I wasn't the old me, I was the new me. You know, I was succeeding. I didn't need her in my life. And um, I had new prospects with girls and I had new friends and everything. Uh, I'd leveled up. I was driving. ran out of batteries and while I've got 6% battery here I just want to finish off this epic uh, video that I was recording about all of this stuff so I just wanted to finish off the story about my, my ex-girlfriend so I wanted to ex explain to you I wanted to I wanted to describe to you something extremely important about how you break out of a shared fantasy that you're in with a narcissist and it's to do with destroying the imago that's in your mind, which is the, the imago is the image of perfection that the narcissist has inserted into your mind that makes you, whenever you think about them, you think about them as a perfect person. 
So I got up to the point where I was like at the traffic lights uh, when driving her back from her, her mum's place and I was like passionately French kissing her at the traffic lights even though I'd just gone to see this scene of utter horror that was her mum's place and all the shit there. I was so infatuated with her that I'm like French kissing her even though I'd just seen all of these red flags and warning signs and gross stuff. And um, so, you know, I was I, I just finished explaining that I caught up with her housemates, Leah and Dan, and they'd showed, they'd spilled the beans, they'd showed me printouts of her emails to multiple other guys and stuff and the, the, the dick pics that they were sending her and all this kind of stuff. She was totally not loyal. She was not monogamous at all. I don't know if she'd done anything, but she was certainly in high high level talks with other dudes to the point that they were sending her dick pics and stuff. Dudes from interstate that were trying to um, trying to get her to to like meet them uh, behind a dumpster uh, in the red light district um, that were going to drive in from another state 700 kilometers away to get their dick sucked by her and stuff like that. So how much of it was fantasy? How much of it was reality? The point is, she was not monogamous in heart and in spirit. And so I was totally disgusted by her. And at the same time, I turned over a new leaf. I'd gotten an excellent job selling Mercedes-Benz new and used cars. I was suddenly driving around in like fucking $160,000 cars. And I didn't tell her any of this, but she must have sniffed it out sort of almost telepathically. She could, by my absence from her, she keenly sniffed out that I'd found something interesting that had taken her off my mind. And I just wanted, before the battery runs out again, I want to describe to you how I broke the imago, how I broke the image of perfection in my mind of her so that every time I would think of her, I wouldn't any longer think of her as a perfect, perfect girlfriend. And how I broke out of the shared fantasy and how I saved myself. Can you imagine if I, if I fucked her enough and got her pregnant, can you imagine? Like she would have destroyed me. Whoever she's with now, my God, she's your problem now. I pity the fool. I pity the fool that's with her now. My God. As bad as she was then, she'd be even worse now. So I want to describe to you some things here that helped me to change how I saw her, okay? So I'd gotten this great job. I was living in an apartment in the city. I had lots of friends. My life resembled friends with like David Schwimmer, Ross, and, 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 and Jennifer Aniston and Chandler and Joey and, and Monica and, and, and all of these. My life was like friends, like I had all these friends. It's just fucking great. And I had this great job and everything. And um, it was just fucking great. And she sniffed it out. And I, she kept texting me for months. It was like she was stalking me. And I would just keep on treating her like shit because I was so angry and I was so offended and I was so heartbroken. I still had feelings for her. But I was so resentful of her for what I discovered about her, thanks to Leah and Dan spilling the beans to me, that I really didn't want anything to do with her. And instinctively, I knew that she was so destabilizing to my well-being that I was like, okay, I love this girl, but I need a break from her. So finally, though, I was like, all right, you fucking bitch. If you want to if you wanna hang out with me, then kind of put your money where your mouth is, prove it, and look, you've got one chance just okay let's let's meet up yep stay over we'll see a movie or something if you don't even show up if you if you're late or whatever fuck you i'm never ever ever i'm gonna block your number so she did show up we hung out we went to the to a movie we saw a good movie it was a mel gibson movie i can't remember which one it was but it was a good movie most of them are aren't they if not all of them all mel gibson movies are good and um uh, it was it was great. She was she was like really nice and everything. And um, we went back to my place and we had great sex. We had better sex than we'd ever had before. Before she was just a starfish. This time she was like responsive and she was more into it. And I was enjoying myself, but I didn't tell her where I worked. I didn't tell her anything about my life and she just accepted that. She wasn't pushing to, to overtly try and find out anything. But Leah, I told this to Leah and Leah said, listen, as soon as
on it and stuff, which I knew was true, but you know. So um, anyways, after that, like um, I lost track of her because I was like, I'd had my fill of her. And I just, by then I just found her so physically disgusting. Like when we had sex that last time, I didn't kiss her once. So I'd gone from passionately French kissing her at the traffic lights, driving her back from her mum's place, to this last encounter, this last liaison. I, 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 I banged her good, but I never ever kissed her again. I didn't kiss her because I was disgusted. I thought that mouth has been places and on the sake of hygiene, okay, so I'm wearing a condom, but on the sake of hygiene, I don't want my mouth to contact that mouth because it's too disgusting. That was how I felt about it. That was one change of heart that, and change of perspective and change of change of, uh, of view, change of, of, of how I could see her. I ch how I saw her changed. The Imago was starting to get cracks in it and it was starting to break. That was one thing. The other extremely important thing is that she had a... Here's, I just want to paint this picture for you. We're out the front of the Centrelink office at Marion Shopping Centre in, in South Australia. It's me and her, her name was Beck. It's me and Beck and her younger half sister. I'd never met or heard of her younger half sister before. And she's sitting on a bench outdoors out the front of the Centrelink. That's the welfare office, the dole office. And she's, she's applying for the dole or she's getting on the dole. And she keeps saying to me, I want to get... job and I want to buy my own house and that sounded plausible but at the same time she's at the dole office getting welfare and she's there with her younger half sister so I got to meet her younger half sister and her younger half sister was a nice enough girl but the thing that I noticed was that her younger half sister was a different race to her her younger half sister was sort of brown and was sort of more aboriginal looking they didn't really look like sisters they didn't look anything like each other her younger half-sister sort of looked like her youngest brother, the one that was malnourished, malnutritioned as she put it, whereas she looked like her, 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 her other brother, the one that was the eldest brother, that was just younger than her. And at that stage, she'd said that that, that brother, you know, that looked, you know, sort of reddy blondy hair and blue eyes, he, she, and a cleft palate, she said that he was now a street kid. He was on the street. She hadn't seen him for a while and she was worried about him. That's what she said. So he'd obviously left living at the mum's place. So I'm, I'm standing there out the front of the Centrelink office and I start finding myself wisecracking at Beck's expense and making jokes about her, which I'd never done before. Like I was starting to break the stranglehold of the Imago. I was starting to break the stranglehold of the shared fantasy. Beck, so Beck, Beck was sitting there with her younger half sister and I, I'd got nothing against the younger half sister, but I didn't find her attractive. And she looked nothing like Beck, and that was starting to break the fantasy th for me. I was like, holy shit, Beck's whole family, like this Aboriginal kind ofness of her mother and her youngest brother, and, and now her younger half sister that I never even heard of before, kind of looks like brown skin and everything. Nothing against brown skin, but like just the look of her, she looked grotty, she looked gross. I didn't like how she looked. She, she just, she looked, it's not that she was ugly, she was a bit ugly, but she just looked like like mud like i don't know she just looked gross to me i just didn't like she just didn't wasn't so much ugliness there was just something uh gross about her like a i don't know like maybe uh i don't know maybe she she reminded me that she wasn't wearing clean clothes or something i'm sure she was but that's just she just seemed grotty the younger half sister i was not turned on by the younger half sister and then i was starting to connect that to beck and going like well beck sort of has some of these attributes so there was that and I'm standing there uh, looking at them in profile as they're sitting there on the bench with their forms for their for their doll forms and um, here's the here's the kicker Beck who's a fairly attractive girl she was putting on more and more weight and she curiously she'd started wearing a tracksuit like tracksuit pants and tracksuit jacket big billowing tracksuit pants and big billowing tracksuit jacket and the, the jacket was zipped up so it wasn't like a flat collar. The jacket was zipped right up, covering her neck. So she was completely zipped up in this tracksuit, this big 
oversized billowing tracksuit kind of like to cover her her increasing heaviness i suppose but she also had a countenance of a boy she was starting to take on a boyish appearance with this tracksuit and the tracksuit itself was was kind of like brightly colored of different colors and i actually made the joke to her that she um i i actually started to think that she was looking a bit boyish and i actually started to think that she was looking a bit clownish so that was the track suit and i'll tell you about the joke in a minute the next thing was that she was wearing these these sneakers these trainers as you say in the uk she was wearing like nikes or something and they were, they were some pretty expensive shoes like they were brand new shoes these sneakers, the, these sports shoes, the, the big thing about them is that they were way too big for her. Now I'm huge and I have huge feet. I have size US 14 uh, feet. And you know, I wear huge sneakers, long sneakers. And she was, you know, narcissist mimic you. And looking back on it, what she was doing was she'd gotten herself some size US men's 11 sneakers and bought them for herself to wear. And these sneakers on her, she's a tall girl, she's a tall girl, but these sneakers on her, even so, were absolutely huge for her. She didn't take men's size US 11 sneakers, for fuck's sake. She'd started, after, after having some exposure to me, she'd started wearing shoes that were way too big for her. And I noticed that, and not only that, but they were brightly colored or multicolored, just like the tracksuit. Overall, she had a boyish appearance to her now, and overall, she had a clownish appearance to her. And it, to her face, in her presence there and then I actually mocked her for the first time in my life I actually mocked her I actually joked at her expense to her face which I would never do before based on the Imago and I actually said to her you've got clown shoes your shoes are so long and so brightly multicolored that you've got clown shoes it looks like you've got clown shoes she had the appearance of a clown wearing this brightly colored billowing tracksuit the, the the pants and the jacket and the shoes were so big and long and oversized that she, she just looked like a clown. Like, what are you trying to dress like a clown? And overall, that looked so out of place to me as she's sitting there in the front of the doll office with her, her funny little sister. Later on in a text message, I referred, I referred to her half sister who I'd only just met there and then at the doll office as the funny little half sister. So again, I'm mocking her whole family situation now. I, I went from being in love with this perfect girl, this Imago, to seeing the half-sister. And I called in a text message to Beck. I said to her, your funny little half-sister, your funny half-sister. I called her funny, funny as in strange, funny little half-sister. I, I called her half-sister strange, your funny little half-sister, your strange half-sister. So I was kind of like pointing out to Beck, oi, the, you, you, you're kind of... Your whole deal is kind of strange. I was, the Imago was starting to break. The image of perfection of this perfect girlfriend was starting to break and verily it shattered and I, nev I never went back. I broke out of the shared fantasy. I broke out of the Imago. I, I removed the Imago out of my head, out of my mind, and she was no longer a perfect person. So, but um, not only that, but my overall impression of her sitting on the bench out the front of the Centrelink office at Marion was one of oddness. I, I'm not one to use the word weird because it's like a shaming language that women use on men, that girls use on guys. Ah, oh, weird, ah, oh, weird, or creepy, ah, oh, creepy, creepy. But I was feeling, I was feeling feelings that I was getting in touch with and the feelings that I was feeling was now I've had an overall look at this girl and her family and, 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 and the, her activities that she gets up to, her, her kind of um, adulterous nature and all of her, all of her weirdness of her family and, and the, all of this shit. Now, and, and you know, just, it's all weird, it's all odd, it's all strange, it's all peculiar, it's all unusual, it's all alien to me, it's foreign to me. This is not how I live my life. This is all really odd. This is all really odd. And I started to laugh at her. Her oddness was becoming apparent. Odd. People often say that narcissists are weirdos, and they are, but they present you with such an image of perfection when they're love bombing you that you don't see it. You see a perfect person. 
but it's only after a while that the illusion has you have a chance to shatter the illusion and if you can shatter the illusion by seeing them for who they really are they're so odd they're so strange they're so weird they're so creepy you're seeing the vampire for the first time as a vampire instead of a supermodel and you're like holy shit this is this is a weird person she's dressing like a boy she's got huge guys shoes on she's got this tracksuit on she just she just kind of looks like she's trying to morph into a boy who has huge feet it's almost like she's trying to be me and in actual fact that intuition was correct because looking back on it i now know that narcissists try and be you they try and copy aspects and elements of you because you're a real human with a real soul they don't have any inner um, constancy to their their personality so they're always copying aspects of other people if not outright copying a whole individual and it occurred i hadn't seen her in a few months and it, it occurred to me that you know what she's kind of like tried to look like me she'd even cut her hair a little bit shorter she was kind of trying to look like me and it felt off i'm telling you it felt off it felt weird it felt odd i i didn't know what to think of it except that i was starting to mock her i was starting to laugh at her and i was starting to feel superior to her and i was starting to feel unattracted to her where i remember i'd previously gone from worshiping her you know on my knees at her feet worshiping her as this perfect girlfriend now i was seeing her in a different light now i was seeing the same individual as a different whole person totally different person and i was like ah i've got the measure of you i've got your number i see who you really are now i don't fully know who you are but i know that you're odd i just i just i was starting to chuckle to myself at how odd she was appearing and how she didn't seem to care that she appeared odd she didn't even she didn't even care that i was like laughing at, at her huge fucking clown shoes she'd gone and bought herself size us 11 guys sports shoes that were multicolored, that were like fucking two and a half inches longer than her feet she just looked unusual <laughs> she just looked unusual so this was the oddness of a female narcissist and by by getting to see her who she really was in a more well-rounded opportunity to view who she was from multiple angles i started and i also was then starting to get a huge dislike of of uh, welfare and there she was at the welfare office i was starting to get a huge dislike of welfare she wasn't exactly this this high-class, sophisticated, um, or wholesome housewife material. She was kind of like a clown in my new impression of her. And it was so weird that she'd self-selected this kind of way of being. It was just too odd. It was just too damn odd. I don't like using the word weird because it has connotations of like, like, um, you know so many so many girls will shame guys by calling them weird or calling them creepy so i don't like to use those words i have an aversion to them but truly if i ever met someone that was weird and creepy it was beck beck the narcissist and after that i basically had very little interest in her i still fantasized about her sometimes i still do sometimes but mostly i was equally or if not a great deal more disgusted by her and weirded out by her oddness and her, her strangeness her inexplicable strangeness than I was attracted to her body or the um, the personality of perfection that I'd originally taken into my mind of her so that's what I wanted to finish up with that was me without even knowing it and at a, a young age of 21 or 22 that was me breaking out of a shared fantasy in the grips of a narcissist's shared fantasy with their imago successfully imprinted in my mind implanted in my mind by this narcissist that's what they do i managed to successfully remove it from my mind 
and to remove myself, extricate myself from the shared fantasy. And a lot of it has to do with seeing the soulmate. You know, I thought she was my soulmate. A lot of it has to do with seeing the soulmate for the first time with fresh eyes, with real eyes. That's the, the etymology of the two words combined. To realize something is to see it with real eyes. And I was seeing this narcissist, this evil demon for the first time with real eyes. And I wasn't liking what I was seeing. And let me put it to you that if the German people wanted to break out of the shared fantasy and to remove and extract the imago of Adolf Hitler, the image of perfection of this, this God from their minds, they needed to see the individual for who they really were. They needed to see that he was basically a proto uh, imagery of Charlie Chaplin. Charlie Chaplin, Adolf Hitler, a clown. It's hard to, it's hard to, to think of that, isn't it? All the fanboys are triggered. They're all outraged. They're all switching off my video. Spiritually, who does Hitler look like? And on a spiritual plane, what's going on there? On a spiritual plane, it's mocking the victim. They present you with two famous figures. One is Charlie Chaplin, the clown, and then comes Hitler, the clown. But you don't think it's a clown, do you? They're mocking you. They're mocking you. You're the victim and they're mocking you. Your soulmate is actually a, a clown. Your soulmate is actually Charlie Chaplin. Your soulmate is actually this trashy clown with big feet, big shoes, like Charlie Chaplin, you know? The same moustache, everything. So you have to start seeing your soulmate in negative terms because you're, you're starting to realize that they're not actually a soulmate. They're not actually a perfect person. And they've actually kept most of their details as much as they can for as long as they can um, from your perception. They're experts at perception management. You know, with Beck, it was only after I'd really gotten to have a well-rounded perspective of, of being able to view her and her life context in multiple different ways from multiple different angles that I started to go, holy shit, now I see what, who and what this is. I didn't know anything about narcissism back then. I didn't know anything about demonology or anything, but I was just picking up on the oddness and, and the clownishness of, of her, of who she, her, her oddness, the strangeness. It, it, was a, it, was just, it was just getting more and more obvious. It's funny how you, you see someone one way and then you see them another way and they morph, they shape shift. And at first there's this pretty girl with nice big tits and nice curvy hips. And then secondarily, hang on, she's changed now. Now she's more like a, like a, it's like she's trying to be me. It's the weirdest thing. She's trying to be me. She's, she's trying to be this, this boy with huge feet is what she's trying to be. And, and, and all the other shit, the, the weird siblings, the funny little half sister and the malnourished younger brother and the, the, the other brother that's now a street kid and he has a cleft palate and he's, oh God, it was, you know, her, her weird mum with a, that's sort of like a quarter Aboriginal or something and has a haggard face like she looks like she's an ex-drug addict or something and all these weird guys hanging around with the mum and what was their weird shit going on and, oh God, it was just, and just the weirdness of her, the, the constant text messaging from her, the insincerity, the... She wanted something to do with me, but it wasn't love, it was something else. She seemed to enjoy my pain. I remember one time I screamed at her on the phone when she just kept on ringing, ringing me up and then hanging up. I, just, I screamed at her. I think I told her to F off. I said it, I screamed it at her um, at my friend's place and my other friend was there. Uh, they're actually my brother's friends, they're a bit older than me. And the guy, he didn't know the context of it. I saw the look in his eyes. He looked really disturbed when I screamed at her on the phone. And then she phoned me back again and she said, ha ha, I got to you. And so for her, it was just a big game. When I actually got so angry at her that I screamed at her, I said, F off. 
she rang me straight back. I, li- I, f- I fucking answered and listened. Like, I didn't, I didn't say anything. I just turned on the answer on my old phone and, and uh, listened to what she had to say. And all she did was she said, ha ha, I got to you. And there is a deer. Let's have a look at that. There's a deer there. There's a deer right there. Where are we? How nice. I haven't seen a deer in so long. Hey, if I had my bow, (laughs) it's kind of hiding in the bushes there. Oh, well, there's a deer. I've often seen deer just around here. I think it's a... It's got no horns. I think it's a sandbar. Sorry, you guys can't see it. And look, we've got 2% battery left or something, but... I'll try and show you the deer. Hang on. You probably won't see it, but there it is. right there. In the
All right, guys, that is the end of this mammoth stream. I hope you found that informative. You're listening to the product of many years of hard-won knowledge, wisdom, 